It's an honor to be here with you this morning and have the privilege of proclaiming God's Word. Part of what I hope we do in chapel at times is that we struggle together with texts that aren't necessarily easiest. So that when you go out into churches, when you step out into the, into the pulpits and you're preaching and in your, in your teaching, what I would hope is that we can see how together to proclaim this whole beautiful text of Scripture, the whole counsel of God. Not just the texts that are easy to proclaim, not just the ones that flow easily when we preach or teach, but rather the ones that are hard, that are difficult to figure out, what do I do with this text? Because if we believe that the whole Bible is the Word of God, what we also must also confess is that this whole text ought to be proclaimed, every part of it. And so I want us to do that, to learn to do that. So I've selected a text out of the middle of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Now while you're turning there, tell you about, there was a time when I was around nine years old, I think, and I found a snake. I found a snake. Now the snake was not alive. Uh, it was dead at the time when I found it. But I was at school and I was in one of those Christian schools, maybe some of you have been in some of those, with a lot of rules. A Christian school with a lot of rules. There were rules about tapering your hair if you were a guy, your haircut. There were rules about pushing in your chairs, about what colors and what shirts you should wear. Everything, there was rules about everything that there was. And I found out in the midst of this whole incident that triumphs and tragedies are not distributed proportionately in this life. Now, I, of course, being a very sharing child, decided when I found that snake that it needed to be shared. This should not be kept to myself at all. And so I happened to notice a girl named Rachel, and she was there with her back to me, and she was playing down with something. And so I went up to Rachel, and I shared the snake. I dropped it down the back of her jumper. And so it was, it was dead. Don't worry about it. It was dead, okay? So I dropped it down the back of her jumper, and... Rachel began to dance. Now, I will have you know that in some of the rules for this school, dancing was prohibited, but she began to dance and she went inside. And so I went back to, to all the things I was up to at that time. And, and a little bit later, a teacher came out. Now, of course, I knew what had happened. They'd seen her dancing and she'd gotten busted over this. And so I was brought in. I'm sure I was being brought in as a witness to the dancing incident. But as it turns out, I was in trouble over dropping the snake down her back. Now think about it, there were no rules in the whole rule book about dropping snakes. Nowhere did it say what you could and could not do with snakes at this point. And in fact, the people in charge seemed to be a little bit, they were on the verge of losing their temper, which also was forbidden in the rules for the school. <laughs> losing their temper. And so we went in and had a, had a discussion. Uh, I don't particularly remember the discussion because it, it didn't seem relevant to, it's all about being more wise and making better choices. And, and I'm sure that was di di directed at the dancing girl there. But, uh, but it was, uh, and so then as leaving, they kept my snake. I found the snake. They took my snake. That means they stole it. That also was forbidden in the school rules for stealing. So somehow... I kept every rule, but I was the one left staying after school. And I learned triumphs and tragedies are not distributed proportionately in this life because everybody else got off and somehow I was the one in trouble. Now, the truth is we know that none of us deserves good. We know that. And the truth is maybe I should have kept the snake to myself in this particular incident. But we can't help but wonder in our lives if God is really running the show, shouldn't triumphs and tragedies be distributed more proportionately in this life? Haven't you wondered that at some point? Why is it that it seems like that they are disproportionate? And if shouldn't, I know that we don't deserve good, none of us do, but shouldn't the cruel face more tragedies than those that keep the rules? Shouldn't faithful believers have fewer sicknesses than people that live for themselves? But the fact is that ease and difficulty don't seem to be distributed proportionately in this life. There are the daily frustrations you face. There's the person who zips past you on the shoulder of the road in the construction zone while you're keeping the rules in your lane and they actually get at the exit ramp first. That's frustrating. But there's also deep frustrations that you and I face. People who long for children and they can't have them. There are people who long for a spouse and can't find 
one. There are people who lose their jobs that they worked hard for, while people that are lazy still ended up employed. There's, people, there's times when cancer steals a saint and spares the reprobate. And it's not that you don't believe in God's sovereignty, but sometimes you just want God's sovereignty to show up a little more clearly. And it's not helped by the fact that we have so many people that are well-meaning people with plastic smiles and cat poster platitudes. God never gives you more than you can handle. Just believe and keep going. And there were the religious equivalents of Emmett in the Lego movie. Do you remember this? The only thing, there's corruption all around him. There's despotism all around him. But what does Emmett say? Everything is awesome. Everything is cool and you're part of the team. This is Emmett running around doing this. And that's why I love Ecclesiastes. Because Ecclesiastes is the God-inspired record of one man's search for some order in the blessing and the brokenness he sees around him. And Ecclesiastes stares all of these struggles in the face and it gives no plastic smiles, no cat poster platitudes, and it's the only book in the Bible that reads like it was written on a Monday morning. It's a great book. And what it lets us know is that God does not teach us, God does not want us to run from the hard questions. He weaves them into his very word. So let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Who is like the wise? Who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Don't take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing. The wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there's a time and a way for everything, though man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has the power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There's no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that's done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. And I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place. They were praised in the city where they had done such things. Oh, this is vanity. This is emptiness, fog, vapor. We'll talk about that later. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, I know. I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. It will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on the earth. There are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. There are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said this also is vanity. I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil throughout the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business done on earth, and neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find the work that is done, find out the work that is done under the sun. However much he may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Let's pray. God, we confess this is the word of the Lord. These are your words to us. Open our minds to understand and to see your truth in these words. In your name we pray, amen. This was written by King Solomon. We're just going to take that as an assumption. I believe that Solomon wrote this text that we read. And Solomon was searching for some order in the brokenness and the blessedness. And he's tried leisure, he's tried work, he's tried pleasure, he's tried knowledge. And what is communicating to us in this is not do as I did. But rather, I tried it and it didn't work. It's what he's trying to communicate. We going back to Emmett in the Lego movie, he has to say everything is awesome when you're part of the team. Everything is awesome when you're living your dream. And what Solomon says is, I ran the team. I lived every dream. Some of it was awesome, but life isn't always awesome even when you're living 
your dreams. And one of the key words to this book is hevel. That's this word that is often translated vanity or sometimes even meaninglessness or emptiness. But I think we can do better than those terms that it's often rendered as. And, to have, and think of it as fog, vapor, cloud. That's kind of the meaning behind this. In other words, what he's saying is not so much that life is meaningless. What he's saying rather is that you can't get a hold of it. It passes too quickly. You've seen the word before in the Bible. It's the word that comes across to us in Genesis as Abel, as Abel, the man Abel. That's the word that's used right there. And you can't get a hold of it. It passes too quickly, just like Abel's life did. Have a emptiness or meaningless, but better yet, fog, vapor, cloud. Because Solomon's life wasn't meaningless and neither is yours. Solomon's life was unpredictable and so is yours. And Solomon's life passed before he did all that he planned and so will yours. And so when we read this word for mean, that's sometimes rendered meaningless, think rather of, let's imagine a man who's out in the hills somewhere and he sees that blanket of fog that comes down on the hills sometimes. And, and he goes out and he decides, I'm gonna take a mason jar out there and I'm going to get some of that fog in that mason jar. And so he goes out there and he climbs up to try to get that. And the fact is that he can't get it. And even if he could get up there to get it, it would be gone before he was able to obtain it. And that's what it's saying right here. And oh, this is, the, it's me, not meaningless, but rather fog, cloud, vapor. And this is a book of perfect balance and beauty. There are 222 lines in this book and it's split into two halves. And in the first half of the book, the question is, is there any order? And he says, yes, there is a time and season. To everything there is a time, turn, turn, turn. To everything there's a season, turn, turn, turn. He says, Except the other part gets added later. But he has, the, that's the, the answer to this. There's a time and season for everything. But then in the second half, he's wrestling with, is anybody under the sun wise enough to see the pattern that's there? And he says in chapter eight, who is like the wise? Who knows how to make sense of it all? Wisdom of a man makes his face to shine and the hardness of his face is changed. Now this is amazing right here. The wisest man in the world says, who is like the wise? Because he knows there is wisdom greater than the wisdom that he possesses. And he says, if you have that, your face would shine. The one who has this, it makes his face to shine. Now, there are certain phrases that they awaken other memories in us. For example, when you hear four score and seven years ago, somebody says just those few words right there. And when you hear those few words, then your mind goes immediately to the Gettysburg Address. That's because it's part of our common cultural heritage. When you hear we the people, there's something that triggers all those different things. And when they hear face to shine, because they are people with whom they have a common heritage of culture that has part of the, the Old Testament embedded into them, especially the law, they're hearing echoes from the early part of scripture. They're hearing echoes from Exodus chapter 34, where it says that they saw Moses' face shining. His, he had been in the presence of God and he'd experienced God's grace in such a way that his face reflected God's glory. They would remember back to Numbers chapter six, where it says, may the Lord bless you and protect you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, look with favor upon you and give you peace. They say, if somebody could make sense of it all, his face would shine like that. If somebody could look at life in this way and make sense of everything that I've been wrestling with, it would be as if he has this pure pleasure and a perfect peace that comes from the presence of God. His face would shine. Now, isn't that what we all want? Don't we all deep inside, we'd love to look at our life and not be perplexed, <laughs> not be wrestling to figure it out, we want to look at our life and we want to look at our children and not worry about what their future is going to be. We'd like to look at ourselves in the mirror and not be wondering what we're supposed to do and not wondering how life will turn out, how we will die, when we will die, all of those things like that. We'd love to look at life with a shining face, a face with this pure pleasure and perfect peace from the presence of God. And sometimes we get those glimpses. Sometimes we look at it, it makes sense. It all comes together. It makes sense for a few moments, but then it fades like the morning fog. 
And so Solomon explores some different ways of, of how, would we, how would this happen in our lives? As having this pure pleasure and perfect peace. And at first he starts out, he says, keep the king's command. Maybe there's a shining face in keeping all the right rules. And he's recognizing that those that are in authority are in authority because God has ordained and allowed them to be in authority. And he gives some really practical wisdom here. Don't turn your back on the king. Don't storm out of his presence. Don't keep pushing an idea that the king's already rejected. There's a time and a place for everything. Gives us real practical wisdom. But then in verse 7, he goes on and he unpacks this more and he lets us know keeping the right rules can't lead to the shining face. For he, the king, not even the king knows his what it is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? No one, not even the king, knows exactly how everything will turn out. And then he goes on and unpacks it more in verse 8. It says, no man has the re- power to retain the spirit, power over death, no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those that are given to it. And in, what, in essence, what he's saying there is even if the king did know it all, He doesn't have the power to control it all. Even if you knew it all, even if you could see absolutely perfectly and make it all, just absolutely see how things ought to be, you don't have the power to control it all. None of us do. You're not even a king, and you know that. Think about the last time that you totally lost it totally lost your temper and became angry about something. Maybe you had planned a perfect date, but your fiance had to work late. Maybe you had one evening you'd set aside to study and to finish that paper that was due the next day, and that was when your hard drive crashed on your computer. Or maybe on Sunday, you were going to make it to church on time for the first time in weeks. And you were making it, you were on the way, it was all going to happen, but that baby's diaper didn't contain everything it was supposed to. And that was the day that you chose to wear white. Now, in any of those, do you know what's really happening when we lose it, when we lose our temper about things like that? What we're real, what's really happening there is you just discovered you aren't sovereign. You just discovered you can't control everything, but you and I love to live under the delusion that we are in charge and in control. When we lose it, it's typically because we realized we aren't, we aren't. So even if we knew it all, we can't control it all. Think about it. Your baby's posterior is not that big, okay? But that can derail your entire morning right there. Now, if you can't even control that, why do you think you can control everything in life to make everything turn out exactly perfect? But we love that delusion. We love the delusion that we are in control. And he lists some things here as examples to say, not even a king can control this. Retain the spirit or power over the day of death. You've been there. The pregnancy test came back and you're all so excited. But then things happened. And it all felt so empty afterwards. And the house felt empty. You have those times that you stand beside somebody who is in the midst of of cancer or something like that. And try as you might and pray as you might, you can't change what's going on. You've been there. Nobody has power over these things. There's no discharge from war. We have brothers and sisters in Christ on the other side of the world right now that are caught up in a conflict and being persecuted because of a conflict and there's no, they can't escape from that. They can't easily escape from the situation. You can't control that. Nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. There's so many people we face in our pastoral ministries that they think something wicked will really satisfy their soul and they keep going back to it. And you pray for them and you counsel them and you just can't stop it. You can't stop it. And then he reveals in verse nine, one of the darkest secrets of all in all of this. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his own hurt. You know what he's letting us know there? Even if you knew it all, and you could control it all. If you had the power to control it all, you would pervert that power. Man has power over man to his own hurt. You don't believe it? 
What would you do if you suddenly had all the power in the world and nobody, not even God, would know what you did with it? That's what J.R. Tolkien's getting at in, in, in The Lord of the Rings. There's the one ring that somebody can have, if they have that, they would have all the power. And people grasp a hold of that, thinking that I will use it for a good purpose. But it corrupts them. And they have to find one creature in Middle Earth who has this curious capacity to resist the power of the ring. But what Solomon lets us know here is there are no hobbits in our world. There's nobody that can contain this power and control this power and keep it from controlling them. And he says there, I have understood this when I was applying my heart to all that is done under the sun. Now, this isn't a statement about cosmology, as if we could get past the sun and things would be different. Rather, under the sun is what we can know based on what we see and experience here. You can follow all the rules, but never find that shining face. In verses 10 through 13, he unpacks this even more. He says, here's proof. There's wicked people who are treated like righteous people and righteous people who end up treated like wicked people. But he lets us know he's not some sort of a foolish cynic who celebrates doubt. He lets us know this in verses 11 and, and verses 12 and 13. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and he prolongs his life, I know that it will be well with those who fear God. Solomon is not some sort of a cynic. Rather, he is a faithful struggler who says, it's unclear, I don't understand it, but I still believe, I still trust. And then he lets us know in verses 14 through 17, if under the sun is all there is, the best you can do is eat, drink, and rejoice. If under the sun is all there is. Under the sun, our, our, the result of our quest for a shining face is in verse 16. He says there, neither day nor night do one's eyes sleep. Endless stress and zero rest. Under the sun, not even a king can know it all. If he could, he still couldn't control it all. And if he possessed power over it all, he would pervert that power. And so we're left here with a dilemma that God created us with a yearning to make sense of the world, but we can't find the answer under the sun. Not even Solomon could. And so God sent a shining face from beyond the sun. That's what it leaves us to see, is that God sent a shining face from beyond the sun. He didn't show up with a shining face. He showed up in a virgin's womb, and he was the wisdom of God in human flesh. And it says in Matthew that he was transfigured before his three closest followers, and his face shone like the sun. And Solomon asked, who is like the wise? And the gospel's answer to us, this one, here he is. Here he is, this one with pure pleasure and perfect peace that comes from the presence of God, the king who knew all, who possessed power over all, but never perverted it at all. But the strange thing about shining faces is simply this. They not only see the world as it is, they see us as we are. And those around Jesus could either fall at his feet and recognize him as the king they were looking for, they were yearning for, deep in their heart, or they could try to destroy him. And so they spat in this shining face and they spiked him to a tree and his blood fell like Abel's, but three days later, he checked himself out of death's hotel, alive and well. And so Paul says in Ephesians, awake, arise from death, and the light of Christ will shine on you. So what does this mean for us? It means number one, nothing under the sun can satisfy a longing that comes from beyond the sun. Nothing under the sun can satisfy a longing from beyond the sun. That's what C.S. Lewis was getting at. If I find in myself desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. You were created with longings that nothing in this world can satisfy. Now, some people chase after pleasures, others after possessions, others after performance, one more project, one more promotion, one more praise from people. And many of the people who are chasing after that satisfaction under the sun are in pulpits or preparing to go into pulpits. They're thinking, if only I finish this degree, I'm going to be satisfied. 
If only we can get this position at this church. If only I can get out of this church and into another one. If only I can get this raise. If only I can pass this class. If only I can please this person. If only this person will be with me. Then everything will be good. But do you know what you're doing there? What we're doing when we do that is we're seeking satisfaction under the sun. And you can be sitting in a seminary classroom and be chasing satisfaction under the sun. You can be teaching in a seminary classroom. You can be behind the pulpit in a seminary chapel and struggle with that. Chasing life, satisfaction under the sun, but we end up like a running dog tied to a post. And it thinks it's going everywhere, but it's only going in circles. And we end up as that great 20th century British theologian Mick Jagger said, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> we can't find satisfaction under the sun. And so if you want to know where is it that I'm seeking some other satisfaction, ask yourself, where does your mind most consistently wander when nothing else demands your attention? Where does your mind go? Behold your God. Behold what you seek for your satisfaction. What do you look at and say, if I lost that, I just couldn't go on? If I lost that dream, that person, I couldn't go on. Behold your real God. Behold that in which you seek satisfaction. The second truth is simply this. The cross is God's answer to the problem of disproportionate suffering and the empty tomb is his triumph over it. You realize God never gives Solomon an answer to all the questions he raises. I mean, it ends up with fear God and keep his commandments uh, and it's sort of a way of saying trust and obey. But ultimately, God doesn't give him an answer. Instead, God gives us himself. In Christ, the king suffers what he never deserved and delivered all that God's justice demands. And in the empty tomb, the king triumphs over death and guarantees the triumph of all who trust him. And what that means practically is your efforts can never guarantee anything in your life will turn out right. But God's effort has already guaranteed that everything in all creation will turn out perfect. But that's not how we lead the church sometimes. That's not how we lead the church. We on Monday mornings, we are captives of the Monday morning rewind, where we think through Sunday and we rewind and wonder if I had done this, what, and we rewind it again, and we rewind it again, and we think if only I had done this, if only I had done this, and we rewind over and over on Monday morning and look at what happened on Sunday or at whatever time it may be, and we keep rewinding and rewinding everything to be able to consider how could I have changed that? Now, there's a place for evaluating how we've done. There's a place for admitting what we've done wrong. But the problem is we're saying, if only I had done this, everything would have turned out right. And the problem isn't that you're rewinding. The problem is you're not rewinding far enough. Rewind all the way back to the empty tomb. Rewind that far. Stop rewinding and playing what you've tried, what you've done, what you could do different, and rewind back to what God in Christ has already done. Rewind back to that. You see, we, we, can, we can believe like Calvinists and behave like open theists. We can believe it's up to God, but we behave like it's all up to us. And the food on which our soul feeds isn't the word of God, but the praises of people. And the place where we seek God's goodness and grace isn't the sure and certain mercies of God in Christ, but the fleeting favor of people. And the place where we seek rest isn't in the sovereignty of God, but in the security of the positions we want. Stop the rewind. Stop the rewind. It's a seeking of satisfaction under the sun. So Solomon says here, where can we find wisdom? Who is like the wise? Who has that shining face? And the rest of scripture answered, there he is. There he is on the cross. There he is bursting forth from the empty tomb. As you drive into Louisville, you can see the Muhammad Ali 
building right there. For the longest time, we went downtown and didn't ever come around there at a time when I was looking. And it just looks like the building has this odd bunch of tiles on the side of it. They're just kind of random all along the side of that building. But one afternoon we came into town and I happened to look at it the right way at the right time and saw that all those seemingly random tiles form a picture of a couple of boxers. I totally had never seen that before because I'd never been far enough back from the building when I was looking at it to be able to see the real picture. And our lives are like that. You look at it up close and it looks random sometimes. It looks like a disproportionate mess. Why did I end up in this job? Why am I taking this class? Why did I experience this rejection? Why do I feel this emptiness? Why this loneliness? Why? Why? But from the perspective of eternity, there's a picture, an image being shaped in your life. And what it looks like is not a couple of boxers. It looks like God in flesh suspended from a cross and a shining face bursting forth from an empty tomb. Who is like the wise? His face would shine. Jesus is wisdom and his face does shine on you and on me and on all who rest in him.